Propping up her high-stakes visit to China, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen stressed the need for a greater U.S.-China collaboration. She says, as two major economies, both the nations have an obligation to responsibly manage their ties. Yellen added that U.S. will keep on taking quote-unquote targeted actions to safeguard its national interests, but clarified that these measures are not intended to gain any economic advantage. The U.S. and China have significant disagreements. Those disagreements need to be communicated clearly and directly. But President Biden and I do not see the relationship between the U.S. and China through the frame of great power conflict. We believe that the world is big enough for both of our countries to thrive. Both nations have an obligation to responsibly manage this relationship, to find a way to live together and share in global prosperity. Chinese media reports that a major outcome of Yellen's visit is an agreement to strengthen communication and cooperation on addressing global challenges. She discussed economic and trade ties, war in Ukraine, as well as human rights during hours-long meeting with Chinese Vice Premier He Lifeng. I also raised the importance of ending Russia's brutal and illegal war against Ukraine. As we continue to monitor the, monitor the domestic situation in Russia, U.S. support for Ukraine will not change. And I communicated that it is, it is essential that Chinese firms avoid providing Russia with material support or assistance with sanctions evasion. Yellen's four days China visit comes weeks after U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken's visit to the nation. It further advances Joe Biden's bid to fix U.S.-China ties. Tensions between the two countries have shot up in recent years, be it trade, geopolitical, or a battle for tech supremacy. Adele Nazarian is a med media fellow at Gold Institute for International Strategy. She is now joining us live to talk more about this latest development. Adele Nazarian, good to see you and welcome to the program. Adele, from the look of it, uh, do you think Janet Yellen was able to de-hyphenate security issues from economics through her trip? Because even from her reception, it was different from that of Blinken's. In a few moments from now, I'll be talking to Adele Nazarian, who is a media fellow at the Gold Institute in America. She will be telling us uh, her views regarding Janet Yellen's visit to China and also Anthony Blinken's tour in China. Adele is now joining us back live and like I, I said, she's a media fellow at Gold Institute for International Strategy. Adele, we had lost you a little bit there. Good to have you with us and welcome to the program. Hi, Eric. Thank you so much. Uh, I was muted there. So it's, it's great to be back on with you again. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. You're absolutely right in pointing out the different message that was sent from Yellen versus um, Secretary of State Antony Blinken. I think it's very difficult to truly separate um, economics from national security. They both truly go hand in hand. But I believe that the concerted effort to, at least on the surface of things, push for a decoupling of two shows the willingness of the U.S. Uh, to thaw relations with China. I think here it's a honestly a situation where both kind of need each other. China, of course, requiring economic assistance truly presents an opportunity for the U.S. here to take that opportunity and rise to a platform to once again operate from a position of strength vis-a-vis uh, -vis the previous way they've been, uh, the position they were in, which was from a position of, frankly, weakness with concessions that were given over the past few years. And I think that when we're looking at this, we have to truly examine the lens of within which U.S.-China relations are strained. You have national security issues, of course. You have the issue of Taiwan. You have the U.S. exports bans on advanced technologies, China's state-led industrial policies, and there's punitive actions against U.S. companies in China. So I really think that this is there. There is an opportunity here, as Secretary uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen said herself, to for for the world to be big enough for both countries to cooperate. Uh, and proceed. 
Adele, this thaw of relationship between the United States and China, what impact will it have if it explodes beyond the borders for countries like India or in the Indo-Pacific region? You know, I think that all the advancement, all the, the work and efforts that India specifically has been making in the Indo-Pacific region would really be a point of contention. It would be counterproductive, frankly, to India's interests. I mean, think about it. India's kind of worst nightmare would be to see a emergence of a U.S.-China G2 for global stability um, in, in the coming years. I think, though, that the way that India here is at a strategic advantage, though, which sets it apart kind of from, from China, is this geographical, sorry, with the U.S., is its geographic proximity um, to China, of course. It has cultural and historic ties, um, military capabilities with a very growing and diverse military. And so I think that India is in a sweet spot, so to speak. And I believe that if the U.S. and China relationship should become strengthened to a level that would harm India's own national security interests, they probably will seek alliances elsewhere, which could then also um, de-accelerate de the U.S.-India relationship. So I think this is very, very sensitive territory that we're treading on here. China's economy is in disarray as we speak and they are seeking help from the West. Apart from fixing their relationship, how else can China overcome their economic woes? I think history will obviously be a very good reference point for the future, but I think that now we, can, we have the opportunity to look at our not so distant history of what occurred during the COVID crisis, uh, global pandemic. And I think the, the world was relying on China strategically for so much of its raw materials, its export goods, um, you know, technology, manufacturing. And I think that China realizes now that uh, they can't necessarily be the one stop shop for the whole world anymore. And that they have humbled, I think, to realize that it benefits them and it's in their best interests to work with other nations and to democratize, not just in the sense of being a democracy with a closed black box where it has, you know, a proletariat that's kind of running the show, but to actually democratize a bit more, become a little bit more transparent and to be willing and open to working with other um, potentially allied nations to improve its own manufacturing capabilities and economic capabilities. And I think that is what it is, it's going to require. I also see, again, just to reiterate the opportunity here that the U.S. is clearly uh, not letting pass by, right. which is for them to operate from a position of strength once again, to negotiate from a position of strength. And I think that uh, depending on what happens, whether it's a, a continuation of this administration in the 2024 election cycle or a new administration, whether it's Republican or Democrat, that of course will also seek to determine a lot. Adele, also something that was a sticking point was the issue of the South China Sea. Uh, we have uh, countries like uh, China, the Philippines and also India having an issue with this um, China's presence in the South China Sea where China claims that uh, the South China Sea, it's part of its own territory. How can this issue be, be resolved going forward? And what impact will that have on the Indo-Pacific region? Well, I think it's, I think India and the Indo-Pacific region have clearly seen the, uh, the consequences of entering these unnecessary or enduring wars. It's very expensive. I think India and the Indo-Pacific, frankly, uh, would really prefer, those countries would prefer to put, to spend their economics and, the, and their um, economic capabilities on helping build the nation up and its people as opposed to spending money on wars that aren't going to benefit their countries and their country people's bottom lines. So I think that if this escalation does continue in the South China Sea and if the U.S., the thawing of U.S.-China relations does not result in a little bit more of a 
de-escalation in that region, then it could honestly end up being uh, having China, India and the Indo-Pacific um, neighboring countries really end up having to enter a uh, very expensive conflict that, frankly, they can't afford. And I think that it's going to end up being the U.S. that's going to fit the bill and what could end up resulting in yet another proxy war between the U.S. and, and China. So hopefully that won't be the case. All right. I've been talking to Adele Nazarian, a media fellow at Gold Institute for International Strategy. Adele, thank you very much for giving us time today. Thank you. We All is now available in your country. Download the app now and get all the news on the move.